Hey, hey, it's the Creative Nonfiction Podcast with your host, Brendan O'Mara. This is the show where I interview the world's best artists about creating works of nonfiction, documentary film, personal essay, memoir, narrative journalism, killer profiles, and reportage, and dive deep into the origin story of the creator, what makes them great, and how you can apply their strategies of mastery to your own work. Sound good? Hit the riff. Today's guest for episode 60 of the Creative Nonfiction Podcast is none other than the godfather, Lee Gutkind. He's the author of about 4,000 books by last count. My producer is nodding. His tagline on his website is writer, speaker, innovator. He's written or edited 49 books, like Almost Human, The Best Seat in the House, But You Have to Stand, The Game is Umpires See It, Trucking with Sam, and many, many more. We'll put links to his book page for his website in the show notes because there's just far too many to link to individually. He also founded the lit journal, now magazine, Creative Nonfiction, which is an incredible well of great writing. I interview many of the essayists from the magazine on my own volition because they're just that good. And what are you going to learn from this episode? Lee tells you that you need to figure out what stories you can tell and no one else has done before. How to find the people who want their stories told in the first place. And of course, how to persevere in the face of untold failure. That's some good, good stuff. Before we dive into the interview, I ask that you leave a review on iTunes or even just a rating. Reviews are icing on the cake, but the more ratings, the more cred, the more people we can reach. Also, I have an email newsletter over at my website, brendanomera.com, that I send out just once a month. It gives you my reading list for the month and what you may have missed from the world of the Creative Nonfiction Podcast. Share this with a friend because I know you're going to dig it. We're starting this interview when I asked Lee what he was driving at 40 years ago when he was just cutting his teeth as a writer in this genre. Thanks for listening. Oh, my God. Well, um, of course, the opportunity. Um, the, the reason I do my work and the reason um, I like my work so much is, first of all, um, like every other writer, I love to write. Um, it's my passion. And um, it's 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 aside from raising my son, it's it's probably the most satisfying thing that I can do. Um, and um, so so uh, it's a very important part of my life. But on the other hand, or the other aspect is, you know, to to kind of be welcome into these various different, uh, often conflicting milieus to be uh, welcomed in or to figure out how to fit in and to learn um, from uh, so many different people about so many different aspects of life is to me such uh, an honor and a pleasure and a challenge. Um, and uh, and it, it fills me with excitement and a bit of trepidation, but a lot of excitement uh, to be able to uh, be a chameleon and fit in and and learn uh, about stuff that I would never, ever know. And so and so I walk into these situations, whether it's baseball or or organ transplantation and um, and um, and I feel um excited on those two levels that I'm going to learn something brand new. I'm going to meet some very interesting people who know a lot of stuff about whatever the subject is, who are uh, committed and compelled to do important work. And at the same and and I'm going to have to figure out who they are uh, from the inside out. And uh, that's incredibly exciting. And at the same time, um, cooking up in my brain all the time uh, is uh, this 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 idea that at some point, all the stuff I'm going to learn um, and process, I'm going to have to uh, put on paper and present to a wide audience. And so when I walk into these situations, whether it's umpiring uh, or something else, I think about those two things all the time, um, how I can fit um, what I can learn 
from the inside out and um, then how I'm going to express it to the world. Where do you think that sensibility and that attraction to being chameleonic and diving into these subcultures to essentially be uh, an anthropologist in a lot of ways? Like, wh- where did that where did that come from? I, I can't answer that exactly, but I can tell you that I went into the military when I was um, when I got out of high school. And I met. Um, I was I was fairly sheltered. I grew up in this uh, this this small area uh, in Pittsburgh uh, called Squirrel Hill, and um, it was uh, it was it was uh, Pittsburgh is an interesting place because even now it's it's not really a homogeneous city. It's it's a place with pockets of different neighborhoods that are very tight and and intimate. And the neighborhoods, even now with Pittsburgh as an international center, a very popular place, place the the neighborhoods kind of are, are remain islands isolated from one another. And so there I was. Um, and and then I went into the military and I met people from all over the United States um, and um, um, of all different colors and uh, nationalities, and uh, I found that in- incredibly interesting and intriguing. And uh, going back to my uh, to my hometown afterwards, I thought this was a great beginning for me. This was a way to kind of learn so much more, as I did in the military, uh, about different aspects of the world. So that was one thing. And then the other thing was uh, when I finally decided that what I wanted to do for the rest of my life was to become a writer. In many ways, the biggest challenge, the hardest thing to figure out if you're going to be a writer of nonfiction is to figure out um, what stories you can tell that no one else has told before. And so um, and so that that's kind of um, how I, I, I look for ideas that uh, that can be turned into essays or more more important to me into books. And uh, but that's that's how. And, and then once uh, I, I got to say that once this motorcycle book was not a, mo- a book about riding a motorcycle around the United States, I did that. Mm-hmm. But it was because I um, what I wanted to do was learn a hell of a lot about the motorcycle subculture, why people ride motorcycles, who rides motorcycles, how motorcycles are put together, what kind of people, what kind of personality does it take to wander around the country on two wheels in the open air, especially during that time in the late 60s or early 70s, when it was in some ways more dangerous to do that than it is today. So um, so it's it's kind of a, a double thing. You're immersing yourself and you're doing something, but you're you're learning something new, and then you're figuring out how you can spin that so what it is you learn can be shared with the larger world. What strategies did you employ early on, and then even even today with your work to get that? I would say especially early on, because now you have the, uh, more of a reputation. So, what strategies did you use to get the kind of access that you've gotten over the years to these subcultures so that they can? Um, trust you and let you be a a participant or a fly on the wall? Well, first of all, yes, early on, it was much more challenging, not necessarily for the motorcycle subculture, but uh, getting involved in uh, um, the world of umpires. What, What you need to try to do is to figure out who you're going to write about or what you're going to write about. You have to select people who want whether they admit it or not, who want to be written about. People who, ha- who, who feel in their heart they have stories, true stories, important real stories that have never been told before. And so uh, that's exactly what happened with, mo- with umpires. There, were, there was, at the time, only one book that I can remember. This is a long time ago, uh, so maybe there was something else. But there were very few books, very few people were writing about uh, umpires. And so approaching people who have not been written about before, who in their heart really uh, want to be written about, featured and focused on, is, is one way of showing, even though you don't have a lot of experience, uh, connecting with them in that way is one way of kind of getting yourself involved. And the other way 
to be accepted is to remember that you are someone who is supposed to be, as so many writers have said before, um, a fly on the wall. You have to kind of blend in, figure out how to blend in so that even though you're inexperienced and um, even though you're making people uncomfortable, you have to fit in so that you are hardly noticed until you find uh, enough sea legs to to take more, uh, to be more aggressive in 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 doing your reporting. And so and, and then you have to just uh uh, pretend that you're a really nice, honest, sincere person and, and that you all, that all you want to really do in life is tell the, the umpire's story. So I did that. And, and I, in fact, um, knew some people who knew some people and vouched for me. And, and I got the access to to these umpires who who really wanted their stories told. I think in the the very very end, last chapter, or maybe it's even in in that author's note, because uh, there's that real uh, that real tense scene where the umpires are the that that core group, they're just they're super frustrated with uh, just how the uh, how the tensions are have risen just it's late in the season, it's grind, and then at the very end, like your your main guy uh, is it Ventelstedt or Wendelstedt? Harry Wendelstead, yeah, yeah. Like at the at the end, like they were you know, talking about, oh, do, can you can you trust the writer? And and eventually, he's just like he, he doesn't care, and he's like, they'll be sending me all over the country doing exhibition games, but I'll tell you, I don't give a shit. It's about time people find out what umpires go through. Exactly. And exactly. That, yeah. So that's exactly what you're talking about. You know, you found the people that need that really wanted that story told. And uh, similarly, in a book that. that to me was um, my most important and character personally important and character shaping book, a book called uh, many sleepless nights, the world of organ transplantation. Um, I was able to make a connection with this guy named Thomas Starzl who, um, who just died um, a few months ago, but he was this champion, this uh, of liver transplantation, but he was criticized and ostracized, literally ostracized by a large block of the medical community because people thought that organ transplantation at that time was immoral and unethical and unscientific and could never work. And there was this guy, Tom Starzl, who said, I don't care what you think. Um, I know I can make this work. I know I can save lives. And and during the time right before um, right before I met him and connected with him, he was he had lost six, seven, eight patients uh, in a row in, in literally in pools of blood um, mm -hmm. just and um, but but he had he knew in his heart that what he was doing was going to change the medical world and change the lives of so many different so many people. And uh, so I caught him at that moment. And again, my promise always is to stay out of a person's way and to just watch and listen and 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 uh, not, you know, not be a part of the team, but be an observer of the team, like, as you said, an anthropologist. And so I caught him at the right moment. And you have to catch people at the right moment when they think they have something really important to communicate and no one is doing it or doing it well enough to suit them. You're, you're alluding to exactly what I kind of wanted to ask you next, which is kind of what needs to be in place for you to pursue a story. And it seems like you, you've, you've been able to, uh, with a lot of the work you've, you're doing, the organ transplant book or the umpires, you, you've managed to get yourself at a, at an inflection point sort of in their in their world where there is maybe that fork in the road or a little bit of inherent conflict which leads to great narrative and um, how do you position yourself to get at that inflection point in peop in these subcultures lives I won't say frequently but uh, but enough that you've been able to craft enough like wonderful books about this like how do you how do you get yourself to that point where you're at the moment where things are starting to crystallize and happen? Sometimes you don't get yourself there. I mean, um, sometimes the story gets you there, if you know what I mean. It's, it's like you need to pick 
let, let me just go back and say that that the challenge that this is the biggest challenge in doing the work I do and uh, and and the work other writers like me do is to is is to find the right story. And sometimes, uh, you know, it's sometimes it takes a year or two years or three years looking for a book before you even start a book, because you are waiting for that moment for that time when you can enter in to a subject and you try to enter in before the tipping point you know you try to uh you suspect that there will be a tipping point there will be a uh, there will be the magic moment that that chain that that compels and incurs change and you need to get in there before that time and then wait whether it's for a month or a year or or or, or four or five years and wait for that change to occur and the change is everything the change is the story uh, because um, because the narrative arc, the, uh, you need to know where wh- when that ch- you need to know when that change is going to occur or when it occurs because that will tell you everything you need to know about the, the arc of the story, how you begin it, how you continue it, and where you end it. So um, there's a lot of timing involved and a lot of good luck. I mean, what would have happened if? Um, it would have been a totally different story, but maybe a pretty good story if Tom Starzl's efforts would have failed and if he had been drummed out of the medical community and if organ transplantation, liver transplantation never saved any more lives or enough lives to make it matter. Then it's a different story, um, but you're still in there prior to that uh, either tipping point or failed tipping point. And, and so you kind of that's what you kind of know and hope for in the back of your mind. Uh, and then and then you watch how things develop. Um, you never really know how things are going to go. But your, your, your focus is on what's my story and where am I going and how will that affect the people who are part of the story? When I was speaking with uh, Dinty Moore uh, a few weeks ago, he was talking about patience being so key for a writer. And I think he's speaking specifically about the writing process itself, being willing and patient to go through draft after draft after draft. It also sounds like a lot of what you were just saying uh, in the research and and the story mining phase, that patience is also key. And uh, how important is that sense of patience when the when the idea in your head, you want it to come to fruition so quick, but sometimes you do have to just wait and see how things play out and pan out. And then when the moment's right, dive in with your, all your resources. You're, you've captured in some ways, uh, the unique aspect of writing creative nonfiction um, and doing this immersion work, because if you're writing fiction or if you're writing a personal essay that doesn't require a great deal of immersion, uh, observation and research, Yes, you will do many drafts uh, because each draft will will help you figure out um, will help you polish your prose better and also figure out um, what you really want to say about whatever that subject is. And it's not it's in no way surprising or shocking, I'm sure, to you or anyone else um, that that writers uh, will write 10, 20, 30, even 40 drafts of something until they feel it works. But what makes this immersion creative nonfiction uh, work so much in many ways more challenging is the fact that um, you are waiting twice. You're waiting for the story to appear. Um, You're waiting for the characters to do whatever it is they need to do and want to do. And then after it all happens, then (laughs) you're you're writing it and, and doing and going through that incredible, uh, monotonous, and at the same time, exhilarating um, revision experience. And so time, patience, yes, plenty of patience, and plenty of time. And uh, the the absolute fight, uh, especially early on in your life as a writer, the absolute fight, fight to keep your com- confidence in yourself and in your story, that sooner or later, something's going to happen that's going to trigger the moment when you begin to write, and that sooner or later, after that moment is triggered, if you continue to do draft after draft, you're going to find that you are rendering uh, uh, the 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 best version of the story that you have been waiting so long to tell. 
confidence is so key and so hard to find and then once found it's even hard to to hold on to um how did you how have you maintained your sense of confidence over the years and how have you tried to instill confidence in others where you see the talent you see work ethic and rigor but maybe not the like they don't have the 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 confidence and to to keep going so like two parts like how do you, how do you how have you maintained it over the years and how do you instill it in others well, it's kind of you to assume that, <laughs> that I have. Um, you know, um, I haven't the slightest idea uh, how. I mean, there's no magic formula to um, amassing the confidence and the courage to keep going, especially when you know that it's not working, or even worse, when you don't know whether it's working or not, which so happen so often happens to a writer. But you have to, in the end, believe in yourself and um, believe in your mission, you know, um, um, believe in the fact that um, you have this idea and that the idea is good and that sooner or later, as you work at it, you have the work ethic and you have the grit and determination. You have to, to feel confident enough that sooner or later it's going to come out OK. And that doesn't necessarily mean that we don't have periods of great discomfort and insecurity and, um, you know, feeling of, of terrible nausea every time you look at your uh, at your keyboard. But um, the test of any great writer is is keeping going and uh, not letting however you see failure as a way of stopping you. You may stop for a month, you may stop for six months, but you need to keep going back at it until it begins to work. I mean, gee whiz, that's what scientists do. Every, uh, every major development in science doesn't necessarily happen the first time um, the scientist walks into the laboratory. It takes a long, long time to figure out how to cure polio or, or, or increase uh, lifespan in cancer. And it takes a hell of a long time to um, shape a manuscript so that it works for you. What do you, what did you, like, when you were coming up, what did you struggle with in terms of uh, writing, editing, revising, whatever? And, like, what do you continue to to struggle with uh, and now at this point in your career? I have much more confidence now in my voice. And so I don't worry nearly as much as I used to about uh the person who is telling the story. I know I can do that, but I continue to, um, and, 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 and that used to be a big problem, uh, especially in the beginning, um, whose voice are you using? You know, most writers, um, when they begin, they have favorite writers, whether it's Susan Orlean or Ernest Hemingway or Thomas Wolfe or God knows, or Tom Wolfe. Um, and you know, you think, well, I want to sound like Gay Talese, or I want to sound like this person or that person. It takes a while for you, a long, long while for you to find your voice. But that's really important. And that's what I initially struggled with. Now, I find that I continually still struggle with, to me, what is... Now, remember, I do mostly... Uh, I am most interested in long form. That is to say, much longer uh, essays or, um, or, or books books that are 65, 75, 80,000 words. And I struggle a lot with figuring out the most challenging part of book writing in nonfiction, and that is the overall narrative arc. You know, how do you get 80,000 words to all fit together? And how do you go back and forth on 10 or 20 or 30 different tangents with a dozen different main characters and, and, and fit it all together so that they all work together and so that there's a, a great, terrific, compelling narrative line kind of glue that keeps the reader going from word one to word 80 to word 80,000. And that to me is, is a gigantic challenge. And, um, and, um, and, and I fight with that all the time. And the other thing, so that's craft to me, that's the hardest part of craft. But the other thing I fight about is, uh, the idea of figuring out for myself and for my readers, what 
the story I am telling actually means, the reflection part, the insight part. So uh, journalists generally, reporters generally, are warned to stay out of the story, not both literally and also from an interpretive point of view. But uh, for most creative nonfiction writers, we are permitted to to enter into the story again, not necessarily as a character, but as a person, as as a voice that guides a reader to to a deeper understanding of what it is, uh, the story, what what of of the mission and the meaning of the story that um, that he or she is recreating. That to me is a big challenge to um, think analytically and to express what I believe and what I feel um, the stories mean and what the reader is supposed to take forth from the stories that I'm telling and from the insight I provide. And that's really a very challenging thing to me. And, um, and, and it's a great balancing act because a reader wants to, um, wants to read a story and uh, in some ways make his or her own determination about what it means. But I also know that uh, a writer needs to guide the reader so that whatever the reader thinks about the, the mission and the meeting, um, that it's clear and that it's concise. The reader knows that I, as the narrator, uh, the person on the inside, is, be, is, is able to guide them toward a better understanding of of the story that uh, is being told and that they're reading. Getting back to that 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 point you made about voice, uh, when I when I watch I watch this documentary uh, Jiro Dreams of Sushi all the time. It's it's really about it's uh, it's about art and like if you just substitute whatever your craft is for the art of making the sushi, like you can just ch- plug and chug that into that equation. And and the main sushi chef he was saying in order to have a good a good sense of taste you have to eat really good food and that that's struck out struck out to me it's like all right if you really want to be a, a great writer you have to read great writing and it, in in developing voice how do you balance or how did how, and how did you balance and you in general reading the good writing imitating the good writing but ultimately having to then break out on your own spur and find your own so like your own your own taste and your own voice on the page while you know you while you've got that simmering underneath those influences of of an Orlean or a Talese or all these people like how do how do you cultivate that who the hell knows <laughs> 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 you, you know, it's a, it's a process. It's you know, it's again, it's like um, um, uh, a writer is like any other artist. Um, Picasso didn't start with um, with with his own unique uh, brushstrokes. Um, he learned from um, from the masters and from uh, life itself, and slowly but surely uh, created his own style. Um, if you look at you know the early work of say Talese or 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 Tom Wolf or um, or Joan Didion, you can see um, where they're going. If you look at the early work and then their later work, you can see that um, that there's it's a process. It's a it's a series of more sophisticated development until until there is a Didion voice or is a Talese voice. And um, but but how you do that? You do that by continuing at it. Um, and learning from uh, from what you've done in the past, and again, what other people have done as well. And because you know, there's no really unique voice. It's a it's 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 a voice. Your voice um, is created by whatever it is inside of you that's that that's making the words effective. Plus all the things you have learned from so many other people over the years. Um, yeah. Yeah, your voice, in essence, becomes kind of a mixtape of all your favorite, your, all your favorite things, and then it's all it's this amalgam that that ultimately becomes you on on the page and what people come to associate as as you. Right, right. And um, I never think about it anymore, to be honest. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, I, I sit down and I write, and um, I mean, I think about, I think more. I don't think about my voice as much as I think about what it is I'm saying. And uh, and 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 uh, some decades ago, I thought about my voice 
first and foremost, um, and not a lot about what I'm saying. And, and let me say, Brendan, um, you mentioned to me in one of your emails about um, your um, your uh, doubts about, um, I, I'm, and if I'm interpreting this wrong, you can tell me, uh, your doubts about the, um, uh, the importance of MFA programs. And, um, and I think generally that um, that um, we teach re, uh, prospective writers, new writers, a hell of a lot of good things about about the craft, um, about creative writing. But I don't think that we teach nearly enough about uh, to our to young writers or let's say new writers about uh, what we can call creative thinking. Mm. That is to say that. Um, I mean, the fact of the matter is we're trying to write a great story. Yes, indeed, we're trying to do that. But we're trying to write a great story because we're trying to influence readers, because we're trying to impact something on those readers. We want to change their minds or inform them about stuff they don't know. And um, that's our mission. Our mission is the message. Our mission and and the way in which you and craft is the way in which you present your your mission or your message. But um, I don't think we spend nearly enough time worrying uh, and helping our students figure out um, um, how to polish, shape, clarify, expand their message, what it is their writing is supposed to do for the reader other than just tell a true story. Mm. And how do you define what it means to have like rigor and tenacity and hard work in this line of work? Because it can be fairly nebulous in an artistic pursuit. But and and you hear people like, oh yeah, how'd you get where you are? Like, oh, I really worked hard. But you know, what does that mean? And I always like getting getting people's impression about what it means to have rigor and tenacity in this line of work. And I wonder how you define it. Well, and, and you know, that's a tough question because everybody works so differently. So to me, I'm, I'm an incredibly regimented person. I get up at the same time. I, um, no matter how late I'm up the night before, I get up at the same time. I don't sleep in. Um, I drink the same coffee um, and, and, um, and I go through the same kind of, of, of routine and I get to my keyboard and uh, I make sure that I produce something on a regular basis all the time. And that, that really helps me whether I do well on that particular day or not. It doesn't really matter. What matters to me is that I continue to produce. Well, it does matter, but um, but it doesn't matter. It doesn't hurt me if, if things don't go well. Uh, to me, uh, the routine of it all is is what I value and what has kept me going through all of those years. Other people um, may have different routines, but my guess is that every artist, every writer and every artist has a routine that they um rely on that uh, they rarely waver from in order to keep um, in order to keep the rhythm of your work going both the rhythm of your work and uh, on paper or on your display but also in your mind um, the, the the book that you're writing or the books that I am writing are always sitting whether whether I am doing yoga or taking a run or teaching a class or talking to you in a podcast there is not a moment there is not one single moment that I am alive where that book isn't kind of somewhere in the back of my head um, just kind of cooking up and resting there tickling me or uh, with ideas uh, about what I'm going to do the following day. I, I think that's 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 what we need to do. We need to to establish establish a way to work that never disconnects us from our work completely so that it's so that whether we're typing or not typing the, the book or the essay is um, is growing um, and changing um, somewhere in our minds. Expand a little bit on your on your morning routine, like you when you wake up and how you go about like conserving those cognitive calories. So you put some things on autopilot so you can then focus on the work. I'm in Pittsburgh about half the time. And in Pittsburgh, I know that my local coffee shop, Starbucks, opens at 6 a.m. 
So um, my alarm will ring at about 530 and I'll do whatever people need to do to get ready for the world. And I will walk to Starbucks. And as I walk to Starbucks, um, I will begin to think much more carefully about what it is um, I'm, I'm going to be typing or writing uh, when I return and I try to do side streets. It's not that far away. It's four or five blocks away, but I, I go through alleys and side streets cause I don't want to meet anyone that I know. And cause then I'm going to have to talk to them and I don't want to talk to them and I don't want to be rude. And I go into Starbucks and they know me and they usually have my, um, my venti dark ready for me. And I take my venti book dark and walk home in the same uh, kind of secretive route again so that people don't see me as I take that walk uh, back and forth um, I begin to focus on what it is I'm going to do at that particular point as a writer and when I get back um, I'm kind of ready and uh, that doesn't necessarily mean that I don't check uh, that I won't take a look to see if there's an important email and it doesn't necessarily mean that I won't I won't put on MSNBC or CNN uh, for a minute or two to kind of figure out uh, what terrible thing happened in Washington, D.C. on that particular day. But basically, um, uh, I, I stay focused and uh, move to my keyboard. And for the next God knows how many hours, maybe it's only an hour and maybe it's three or four or five hours, depending upon how my, my day and my mood um, and my momentum. Um, um, I do what I need to do to continue on with whatever writing project. And I try to do that seven days a week, uh, um, all the time. And, um, and whenever it's done, whenever I've had enough for the day or the day has run out, then I kind of look, um, I, I look at the rest, the other aspects of my life and move on. And I think, uh, what sometimes leads to a great a great morning is actually having like a good evening routine as well kind of setting setting the pieces in motion the night before and i was wondering maybe do you have a an evening routine where you set things up for the next day so that way you're always winning the morning and then subsequently winning the day i never um go to sleep without thinking for a moment about um, exactly what I just talked to you about, mm -hmm. about what I'm going to write the following morning. And I never uh, leave my keyboard um, at the end of whatever writing hour or two hours or, or eight hours. I never leave without figuring out what I'm going to do tomorrow. And uh, and this cooking up process that I told you that kind of stays in the back of my head, in the back of my mind, um, I plant it there before I leave my work. And um, so that, again, I'm ready for it the following day and um, before the light goes out and I decide it's time for me to sleep. Um, I think pretty much for a second, doesn't take a long time. I think pretty much about um, what my writing is going to bring to me the follow, how I'm going to begin my work the following day. And who at a young age for you uh, gave you the permission you needed to pursue this line of work, like an influential mentor and permission, confidence to say, oh, Lee, you keep going. This is, you know, keep working, keep going. Yeah. Um, uh, first of all, um, okay, so I can give you three people. Um, one, after the military, I went into, um, uh, I had no idea what the hell I, I was going to do. Um, I graduated high school in, uh, at the bottom of the fifth, fifth of my class. So I was certainly no scholar and I certainly couldn't get into any uh, major university. So after the military, I, um, I enrolled at night, in night school at the University of Pittsburgh and my freshman English teacher said to me after reading an essay that I wrote, said to me, um, and I have to admit, maybe it was half joking or half not. Um, but he said to me, you know, this essay is pretty good. Um, you ought to think about being a writer. That really uh, that really turned me on. Uh, that, I mean, it was the first time anyone had really given me any career guidance or told me that I could do something really well. And so that was really helpful. Uh, and then there was a professor at the university some years later uh, whose name was Montgomery Culver, who was a short story writer. And uh, Mon Mon uh, Culver started the creative writing program at the University of Pittsburgh many years ago. And he was very encouraging to me. I remember once uh, writing this uh, this short story 
that um, that I thought was pretty funny. Um, but I didn't know whether it was going to be anybody else thought was pretty funny. And um, we went to a workshop. Um, uh, it was an evening workshop. Uh, it was like an informal evening workshop for uh, kind of invited students, not for credit or anything. And he said and he would read a one. He would read one story every week and then we would discuss it. And so I gave him my story and I was really uh, very nervous, really scared because because uh, I, I was a new writer and I had tried some, you know, tried to do something funny. Um, and he looked at it and he read the first page. And um, about the end of the about the middle of the second page, he started to laugh like crazy. Mm-hmm. And I and that uh, was one of the greatest feelings that I could remember that that I made Monty laugh and with my work. And it gave me a great deal of confidence. And uh, he was very supportive of, of, of this um, this clever stuff that I thought I was writing. So, um, again, encouragement encouragement and reinforcement was was very helpful and finally i absolutely loved the work of gay talise and um i read gay talise so often um i just thought um he did exactly what i wanted to do with my life and he did it so much better i know that i'll than i'll ever be able to do but just reading him and i reached out to him early on in my life he's been very um supportive and helpful um as a as an advisor and and as a friend, so um, so those three things gave me a great deal of confidence. Take us to the the months or maybe years leading up to when you started the journal and then what subsequently became the magazine, Creative Nonfiction. Um, what was the motivation and how did you get that off the ground? I'm doing this work, this creative nonfiction work, uh, and it wasn't called Creative Nonfiction then. I'm writing these true stories, these, um, and I found myself in an English department, again, the University of Pittsburgh, and it, it, it's a fine place. The University of Pittsburgh it was a fine place, and my colleagues in the English department and the writing program were, were, were absolutely um, nice people with um, talented people, but, uh, but there was this incredible pushback over the idea that nonfiction – whether uh, that nonfiction could be artful, that nonfiction could stay uh, on the same plateau and the same level as poetry and fiction and, and, and drama. The pushback was just awful. It had to do one thing with the whole idea in English departments. Um, so often um, um, it's an issue of turf. Sometimes, you know, if we start teaching narrative nonfiction or whatever you wanted to call it, then maybe the poets or the fiction writers um, or the composition folks or the literary people won't get as much money or as much support. So so it was a turf issue, but it was more than it was also an issue of the fact that that what we always thought about nonfiction was that it was journalism. Journalism was kind of like plumbing and essays were were supposed to be scholarly. But could you do an artful essay? And was it as challenging and important to the world as a as a good poem or a terrific short story? Um, It was uh, there was some massive pushback, not just at my university, but at other universities as well. And so I thought, okay, how do I get to these people? How do I get them to see that that um, I'm not competing with them um, and that we should be offering our students this 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 thing that w- that's that's coming alive? Um, I mean, uh, Hemingway uh, Orwell uh, had written some absolutely terrific nonfiction but, um, o- over the years. Um, the new journalism with Gay Talese and Truman Capote. This was all happening and people were reading this work and appreciating it and, and not giving uh, my students the opportunity to learn how to do this and to learn how important it was, uh, seemed to me not to be right. And so I, how do I get to an academic? Um, I get to an academic by maybe doing what they most appreciate. And so I decided if I started a literary journal that looked like a poetry journal or looked like a fiction journal, uh, but was filled with narrative nonfiction alone, then I might be able to get them to see that it was equally important and equally challenging to do. Mm -hmm. So that's why I started um, Creative Nonfiction. 
as a journal, a literary journal. And frankly, um, I thought I was going to do this and uh, I would publish a few issues and I would make my point and I would give the journal to my department and, and we would we would start something there. The journal um, made a significant national and soon and, and also international impact. But um, the, the folks in my department didn't think at that moment that it was worth taking over. And so I decided I'm not going to let this go. This was too important to me. And I established a uh, independent nonprofit foundation and uh, moved on from there. But the, the reason was I needed to prove to the world that this was as important as any other literary art form. It's uh, as you write in the introduction to In Fact, it's 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 funny that a lot of those early submissions came from, say, poets and novelists. Some of the people I suspect that you got some of that pushback from in the academic world, you know, that didn't want the bl those blurred lines turned out to be the people submitting well, the type of person submitting early on to creative nonfiction. Uh, how did, the, did that like uh, what degree of surprise did you find when you were like, wow, these people aren't reporters. They're actually the, you know, the the high art writers trying to do something that's verifiably true or a true story. It was really incredibly surprising. It was delightful and surprising um if you're if, if i don't know if you know this um but the second issue of creative nonfiction, um every issue has a theme and the second issue was poets writing prose um i think of that was that maybe it's the third issue now i can't remember if it was two or three but um because i kept getting these these knockout essays by poets narrative essays and um and i thought Wow, this is really incredible. This is and and wonderful, and um, and uh, it was very surprising to me. And I uh, got very very few narrative essays from journalists, and I thought it would just be the opposite. I thought here's this. I mean, I've talked to so many. I had talked to so many journalists over the years who kept complaining to me that their editors didn't give them the opportunity to say what they wanted to say in the voice they wanted to use. Um, they were, they were, they were hemmed in by the structure of, of, of what a journalistic story needed to be. And by the idea that we could be objective and we didn't, and we, we, we should be objective and not subjective. So I thought this was a great opportunity for journalists to show what they could do. Um, but it just didn't happen. Um, it took a long time for it to happen, but poets flocked to this, um, to, to our, through our, uh, to our journal. And, um, and it was, it was delightful to, to have it happen. And, um, and there were of course, uh, terrific poets who were in fact writing, uh, creative nonfiction. Um, uh, W S Merwin wrote a wonderful memoir, uh, in the, oh, I think it was the late seventies, early eighties. And Diane Ackerman did some incredible work. Um, and then of course, later on, Mary Carr started writing, um, pro nonfiction prose. So it was, um, it was all very surprising and exciting. How has creative nonfiction evolved over the years, uh, beyond just the physical format and uh, where do you see it going? OK, beyond the physical format, you know, now um, we have a second uh, magazine. We're moving into the second year of our second magazine called True Story. Um, and True Story is a one essay pocket size uh, magazine uh, that uh, kind of looks like half of a chapbook. And uh, we're and the, which goes to our subscribers once a month. You can put it in your back pocket, or put it, or hide it under the Kleenex box in your bathroom, and um, and 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 read it. So so that has occurred, and we'll see how well that goes. We're going to start a Kickstarter that was funded for the first year by the National Endowment for the Arts, but um, uh, we need to worry about funding for the upcoming couple of years. So there will be at the end of uh, sometime in August a Kickstarter to try to uh, raise enough funds to keep it going. We have a uh, re annual writers conference that we've done for five years in a row this fifth year it's over Memorial Day. And this fifth year, um, uh, this fifth conference was really quite terrific. We had as uh, not a keynote speaker, but a keynote panel with high ranking editors from um, from Esquire, The New Yorker, uh, Harper's. 
uh, New York Times Magazine and the Paris Review. Um, and the keynote panel was the state of the American magazine. And I led a uh, two hour discussion on uh, what's on 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 again, what's going to happen in the world. Why are magazines um, still prospering in this uh, in this uh, digital age? paper magazines, and where are they going to go in the future? So every Memorial Day, we have that um, weekend, we have that conference. And, and we also have a um, online school, we uh, offer online creative nonfiction classes to, um, to almost a 1000 people from throughout the world, uh, on an annual basis. So that has occurred. And also we have a book imprint, uh, in fact, books that are uh, that's internationally distributed. We have some titles that have done very well. And um, so all of that is occurring. Um, and we've gotten grants or have been recipients of sub awards from uh, the National Found Science Foundation. Um, so all of that is occurring simultaneously. Um, I work really hard to to raise this money. And today. Uh, the nonprofit world, especially in literature, is uh, is is not the world it was a long time ago. It's very very difficult to to keep a nonprofit literary organization afloat, and the the more income you generate by doing other things like um, like having online schools, um, um, the more you can stay um, the more you can stay alive uh, because. Um, um, as you as you recall from my conversation a little while ago, we did not receive institutional re support from the University of Pittsburgh, um, which turned out to be the best thing that could happen because now uh, creative nonfiction is is independent and can go um, and and doesn't have to rely on uh, any any institution to keep it going. What did a successful writer look like to you at say age twenty thirty? How did that evolve, the idea of success as a writer? Well, you know, we all think about the same thing. We want to write um, a, a good book and we want it to be reviewed on the front page of the New York Times or somewhere in the Times or written about in the Times or in some other major publication. And we want to win a prize or two or three or four. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, that's kind of what most writers want. And um, so that's the way it looked to me then. And I wouldn't mind front page review in the Times and I wouldn't mind a few prizes. But um, that stuff now means much less to me than it used to. I, I think what happens is and I've, I, I know I, I mentioned this before, but it's really important to me and I, and I hope to many other writers that the work we do means something bigger to the world. Yes, being a writer is egocentric and 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 self-satisfying in many different ways, but to me what my work, whether it's as an editor or a writer um, or even a speaker, what my work can do to to change the shape of and of the world is to me incredibly important. And if I can touch a reader or two or three enough so that they'll let me know I have touched them, then that to me is 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 the the, the satisfying um, and perhaps triumphant experience of a of, of a writer's career. So it's great to be a bestseller. I've never have been. And um, and I wouldn't I would love that. But but that's not really what it's all about to me. And I don't think it should be really what it's all about to other writers. It's 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 what our combined thoughts and ideas and actions can bring to a larger audience. The people we're really writing for. We are not writing for ourselves. We're writing for the the bigger world. And I think that that's incredibly important. And to me, that's what keeps me going. Mm. And what are some books that you find yourself rereading over and over again, if in fact you are a rereader of books? I hardly reread books, but um, I go back to uh, my friend Gay Talese's uh, first collection um, of profiles where that fr famous Frank Sinatra had a cold profile appeared, uh, Fame and Obscurity. Uh, he profiled Sinatra. He 
profiled Ava Gardner. He profiled um, uh, a, a famous playwright at the time, um, um, or famous director Joshua Logan. He, fam- he profiled Joe Lewis. Um, he really showed me how one can can uh, immerse themselves in other people's lives and um, and and capture those people in a very special way. And then the book that I go back to um, um, all the time um, is uh, On the Road uh, by Jack Kerouac. It's not just um, I mean, it's the ultimate the perfect, the wonderful, the greatest road book ever written. And it's so filled with passion and desire and and incredibly powerful prose and memorable characters that live in your mind forever and ever. And um, so th- th- that's a book that oh, once every couple of years, I, when, I, when I'm feeling uh, that I need a little bit of uh, inspiration, I'll go back and read passages and uh, and um, imagine Kerouac um, um, working on that book. As you know, um, he wrote that the first the first of his final draft um, on on this roll of, of paper that uh, he pasted together. And he wrote it quickly in three or four or five weeks. And he sat there. The story is he sat there in his um, in his New York apartment in the middle of the summer, changing his T-shirt from time to time and sweating um, as um, uh, air conditioning. Of course, he didn't have and maybe wasn't available then um, and uh, and produce this book. So I like to read the book. But then I like to imagine Kerouac and how hard he worked and how much um, how much of himself he poured into it. And it's an, it's an, uh, an inspiring thing for me to do. If you had to start over at, say, age 25, even 30 in the year 2017, 2018, how would you approach doing this kind of journalism in this media climate? Um, I'm not sure I would do it. <laughs> so I don't know. I don't want to start over, Brendan. Um, um, <laughs> that's that's too difficult. To, I'm not I'm not at all. Sh- I mean, who knows? You know, my life has turned out to be a pretty damn good life. And and I and, I, and you know, and I, I expect that I will continue to do my work for a long, long time. Starting over and ever is something I it's um, I mean, every day to me is a new start. And everything I write is a new start. And I guess um, I guess I would do the same thing. I guess. I don't know. Um, I don't even want to know. <laughs> it, what appeals more to your, your taste? Um, research reporting, writing, or editing, revising? They're all part of the same process. Hmm. You know, it's, it's one, two, three, four, five. Uh, uh, the immersion part to me is, is the greatest um, Again, because um, a writer is so um, alone with his or her work, whether you're working, uh, um, even if you're working in a coffee shop, which many writers do these days, um, you're still all alone. You're still, you know, it's it's you and your keyboard. It's you and your yellow pad. It's just you. It drives you crazy. It's 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 the the loneliness and the and the loneliness and the aloneness and uh, the isolation and you can't quite talk about it you can't you can't you can't write something and then go to your local bar and talk about um what you've written that would be really stupid if you if you talk it out maybe you're not going to write it out so what's on your paper what's in your display is is only for you to know uh, until you think you're ready to share it with the world and so doing these immersions and forcing yourself out into the world is is an absolute wonderful thing. It's um, it's it, it it's it's a great balance to uh, the lonely independence that you have when it's only you and your keyboard and your room and your coffee um, um, and uh, the ticking of the clock as as the minutes and the hours go by. What a what can somebody. Uh, an emerging writer, like novice, intermediate, even someone who you would on paper consider an expert, even though you never truly master it. Um, what can somebody do today to become a better crafter of these kinds of true stories? A sharpening the saw type exercise that you might be able to do daily to say, all right, I'm going to keep trying to improve that little bit. I'm not sure that that sharpening of the saw every day 
is the way in which you go about doing you you get yourself ready to do this work. Mm-hmm. I think that um, what we need to do, I talked to you before about routine. We need to establish a routine, but we also have to be incredibly, unbelievably spontaneous to experience as much of the world as we can. So do your four hours with your keyboard and then, God damn it, do something else. Um, connect with 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 other people and learn from those other people. Um, and it will bring you insight and satisfaction and uh, and and keep you thinking about not only what you're writing about today, but what you're going to write about tomorrow. And uh, before I let you get out of here, Lee, uh, where where does your optimism lie with uh, this kind of work and the state of magazines and narrative journalism in general? Well, narrative, creative nonfiction is the fastest growing genre in the publishing industry and um, academics more and more are are capturing using the techniques of the creative nonfiction writer. We've been telling stories through uh, beginning with the caveman. Uh, we've been telling stories beginning with the Bible and um, and we're still telling stories now and stories um, are are. Uh, as I said, from a commercial point of view, are, are, are incredibly important and popular. And stories connect other people in all kinds of different ways. And here we are, professional storytellers. And, uh, and the art of the story is, became, is becoming, of the true story especially, is becoming so much more recognized and, and, and looms as something really important in our society, in all societies. And I think that that's going to continue to happen. Uh, I'm encouraged by by the fact that um, um, more magazines uh, are are writing or publishing longer stories. Even our little true story magazine. Now we have maybe 1500 subscribers and uh, people are reading lo- these long stories and um, and enjoying them uh, and uh, and benefiting from them. I'm quite optimistic about I'm, there's a lot of things I'm not necessarily optimistic about, but creative nonfiction, the idea of writing true stories has, has changed our culture in, in many very important ways, and I think it's going to continue. That's going to do it, folks. Thanks again to Lee Gutkin for coming on the podcast and sharing his experiences and his stories and advice about what it means to create works of great nonfiction. As a final call to action, I just ask that, again, leave reviews, share with a friend, uh, put a rating down. Uh, Like I said, it all helps. Helps with ranking and visibility. And that's what we're after, is to try to be more visible, showcase more writers, showcase their work, and be a be a fun place to to share these kind of ideas and these interviews and get get their work in front of more people that's always the motivation and the ethos of this podcast so if you would do that i would deeply appreciate it thanks for listening and we'll be back next week with another episode of the creative nonfiction podcast thank you <laughs>